I want to reemphasize something that Bruce said. This is the beginning of a dialogue. This is not a decision-making process. This is not a public input process. This is a dialogue about people who care about the forests, uh, particularly those frequent fire forests that we're going to probably focus a lot of our time on. Um, and let me tell you why I think it's important. And I'll start off, given that we have such a great internal audience, is this because we have an opinion. We, the Forest Service, as folks who have managed public lands and public forests for over 100 years, have an opinion. And it's really important for me to communicate to you all is that we have an opinion. Uh, it's not that we are the arbiter of other people's opinions. It's not that we are some empty vessel on which people pour their views. We, as professional land managers, have an opinion. And this is an OK thing. Doesn't mean that's the decision. But that opinion must be heard, it must be debated, and there must be some dialogue. So let me uh, sort of step back 30 years or so. Uh, I was in the outfit when we got the original planning rule. It's just a scary, scary thing to think you're that old. Uh, and we started this whole idea of saying, so how do you plan for what you do with public forests or public lands in general? Um, and, and for me, it was a really fascinating experience I, at that time, was uh, still in school. Uh, and I was taking an integrated resource planning course at CSU. Uh, and there were three permanent employees on that ranger district and a couple of seasonals, and I was a college work study student. They had no idea, what, do you, what is this planning thing? Oh, you, you're taking a planning course in school. You become the district representative to the planning team that had been put together. The rapper Roosevelt was a pilot for us under Gray Reynolds at that time. And it was, a, it was a process that began to show me that those kind of efforts set the stage for what would be done for decades. Really, really important work and decisions were made in that process. And in doing so, things drive that process that uh, end up creating those consequences, you know, 20 years later. Some of our plans are still that old. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating kind of thought. Um, and we're in the middle of this process yet again. This is where desired future condition becomes one of those key forces I think we need to have a conversation about. Uh, back in those days, it was driven by two things from my perspective. One is how do we zone the forest with some concept of what it would be used for. But more importantly, it was driven by what's going to come off of it. What would be the consumptive uses of those national forests and the resources they contain? And it drove our analysis. It drove the work that we did. Uh, in ways, at that time, I didn't appreciate. But looking backwards, I appreciate very much. Because while there was some ecological underpinning to that work, the reality was it was just that. It was almost background. It was like uh, the, the, the far ground with all the work being about how do we zone this up where appropriate uses would occur and what would come off of that landscape. And the key was in what are the consequences to the natural system out there. Um, and for me, that really set uh, in, in me a real conundrum as a person who eventually became a certified silviculturist. I thought about the functioning systems and the work that needed to be occurred. There was this conflict about did we really think about that as much as we should and we did this big, challenging kind of work. So let me fast forward to where we got into the mid to late 90s. Uh, we began to have a lot more sensitivity about the systems that we manage. And we began to see the things that were occurring on that system that were different, we weren't used to. And by that, I mean very large scale insect and disease outbreaks and large catastrophic wildfires. Growing up in the Forest Service, if we had a 5,000 acre fire, it was huge. Pull out the stops, project fire, everybody run and do this thing. It would, they were large, large, large fires. Uh, exceeding that was sort of unheard of until we had Florida. And then all of a sudden we began to see this ever increasing size and scale of natural disturbance that was behaving in very unnatural ways that began to wake us up to Things aren't really copacetic at home. We've got to do some things. And we began to really think more and more about natural systems, what's going on here, what are some of those broader forces that are changing the way our forests are behaving. 
The natural processes were behaving in ways we just weren't used to. Uh, but we did the thing that we typically do, uh, is that we, we started there and then we quickly ran to say, how do you address the effects of what's occurring on people, uh, on systems, and we created the National Fire Plan. I was one of the first directors of the National Fire Plan in the Forest Service. And one of the things that I found that it did is it quickly gravitated towards uh, how many engines you're going to have, how many helicopters, and how many crews. In other words, it became about how do you respond to those events to minimize the effect primarily on people. Uh, while there was talk about the system, in reality what was driven was a social impact on people and the things that came off of the force they no longer could get when you had these large catastrophic wildfires. Uh, we, we worked like heck to get the concept of the restoration of fire adapted ecosystems into the fire plan, but again, it gets overwhelmed by some of the social aspects of what occurs uh, when these kind of things become broad scale and they begin to affect society as a whole. Not just a community, not just a group of people, but society as a whole. That's why we ended up with the National Fire Plan. It wasn't because somebody said, oh, big fires are bad. It was about what are big fires doing? One of the key pieces about this is really fascinating when you go back to history and you look at that series of events, the two years that led up to the creation of the National Fire Plan, is two really important things occur. First is the Forest Service, a few years prior to that, had started working on what we called the cohesive strategy. And it was about what's going on in our system that's creating these problems. And we really did get back to it, it was forested and woodland conditions were causing this. And, and what was that? It was this mass accumulation of fuels that resulted from a lot of things that had led us up to that point in time. Uh, and in that, in that conversation, it became clear, we got to figure out how do we go about putting the system back in a condition that really recognized the circumstances and the factors and influences that currently were impinging upon our forested ecosystems. And so it was, really, it was really a fascinating exercise going through that and the fights and the arguments behind the scenes because it was purely a Forest Service thing and most folks didn't know a lot about the cohesive strategies being put together. Well, you add to that then two fires, successive seasons of big impacted fires that caught national attention. Eventually, the big fire in California pushed it over the edge. You had enough political clout, the National Fire Plan was born. Uh, but again, born out of the impacts to people. Uh, and so one of the worries I've had in this whole process is how do we bring it back to the underlying systems and the problems in those systems that we perceive as professionals. And for me, that's what's brought us to the room today, what we've been working towards for a number of years, is how do we create a dialogue about desired future conditions in a very public environment. Uh, here in the region, we have moved aggressively forward with, with forest planning on a number of units. And we've articulated a desired future condition in each one of those national force plans. Uh, yet, I sense at times, well, we did that. Now we're back here dealing with what conditions we have put on the landscape. And it, it's caused me to furrow my brow and say, okay, why are we not having a richer conversation about what we believe these forests ought to look like in today's world? Both from the social pressures that exist on them the uh, sort of the environmental pressures that are occurring that are altered sort of the way we look at the landscape and what occurs from invasives to climate change uh, to, to all of those underlying circumstances that are create challenges for those folks who manage land and try to put them in a condition. And so uh, for me, it made it imperative that we come together and we begin to talk about that desired future condition. Those structures, those functioning systems that we think we need on the landscape to be resilient to all these things that are, we think are coming down the road. And it needs to be a vigorous debate. It needs to be one that really is science focused. And we'll all have different perspectives. We'll stand on that spectrum of where we think science tells us to go in a certain way. But we must have that dialogue and not just a social dialogue. This is a thing that worries me is again, yet again, I see us this turning into a social dialogue and not one about what we think the systems are telling us. For me, it's so easy to, to think of it as much as you would a, a, a GIS system. 
is there's, there's layers that must be applied, but you can't focus on a single layer. To do so is not carrying out our responsibilities as professional public land managers. So we've got to have a dialogue about what do we think these ecosystems ought to look like given the things that we know that impinge upon them. And then there will be a layer of social concerns, issues, and desires that get laid on it, but they can't be looked at independently. They've got to be looked at together. And so for me, I wanted to drive a discussion about this that really tried to bring the science to the table, that talked about what we thought it ought to be, what it should look like, what it would take to get there, and then later on the social things that would tell us how far we might go <coughs> in accomplishing that. So for me, that was what this was about, a vigorous dialogue. Now, um, you know, one of the things I didn't want this to be is set up as some sort of classroom kind of setting where people think they're coming to hear what they're supposed to do. Uh, each and every one of you sitting out there are professional land managers of, of one ilk or another. Uh, and you have an opinion. You have an idea based upon your unique sets of understanding, knowledge, education, background. Uh, I want you to bring that into the room, into the field in this dialogue about how you perceive it. What do you think it ought to be? How do those desired future conditions we've already articulated in our force plan really align with what your, your thoughts and uh, your experience tells you? Because it's critical that we have this debate and dialogue in a very open way, in a very vigorous way. Not to lead to a decision here at the end or whatever. As far as I'm concerned, we're driving towards decisions in our forest plans as we speak with a desired future condition that we've articulated to the public and that we've had some discussion about. But that discussion, I think, has not been as rich as it can be in the underlying science and the, the ecosystem perspective that we must have in, this, in the work that we're doing. So that's really why I think we're here. Uh, and for me, like I say, I think it's long overdue. Uh, I really like the way this turned out and that we got a chance to have some internal dialogue, some internal expression to help us sort of set how, how the public dialogue will go as we bring folks into this with us. Um, and, and so I'm actually glad the way it turned out. I think this is going to be a great place for us to begin. Uh, for me, I hope you don't let whoever happens to be uh, in the room or in the field temper what you need to say, what you're thinking, how you're feeling. Because for me, then we lose. We lose if we don't bring all of that into the room. Uh, most of you out here are far better at understanding and articulating what we need to do in these systems than I do. You work with them day in, day out, some of you for decades. You know these systems, you know what's happening to them, you know uh, in your own perspective of how they ought to be and what you think our trajectory ought to be in accomplishing those. So for me, uh, uh, it, it brings us to a point in time that's been set up for about a decade now, a little over a decade of where we've really focused on this and the window of opportunities here, yet another historic fire season, at least in the Southwest. It opens people's minds. It makes them re remember, you know, the Rodeo Chesky was not a one-time event. Uh, this event is going to reoccur across this landscape until it's all done. Either somehow we put it in a condition that makes it resilient to that or Ma Nature has done it. And for me, that's the challenge that we still have in front of us today, is how do we get to that? Our driving uh, passion should be, how do we make these forests resilient to the, the forces and functions of these ecosystems we know are going to be there and will exist for a while? So it's a noble challenge. It's important. It's what this, the Forest Service started out with, that challenge of how do you take care of a forest with things we see happening we don't think ought to, and how do we, how do we move that forward in, in the best professional way we know how by articulating what we believe based upon our knowledge, skills, and experiences. So for me, I am here to listen. I will engage, I will talk, but I don't have an answer. So I hope because I have a certain title that that doesn't in any way influence what you guys say, how you feel, and what you think. Critically important you not let that happen. I introduced myself the way I did for a particular purpose. I am a forester first. And foremost, that's what I got in this outfit to do. That's what I did for a lot of my career. And the fact that I somehow ended up in the job I am has little connection to the fact of where my passion is about the work that we do. And so for me, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I thank the institutes for setting this up, helping us figure out the way to, to go through this process, to engage people, 
bringing you know your unique scientific perspectives into this room is critically important. So thanks to all of you, and let's get on with it.